What is a beginning? It's a simple word, but difficult to define, in part because it admits of many applications. Beginning is a relative term. It always points to something beyond itself. Thus, to speak of a beginning necessarily includes a reference to something or things that follow from it. Looking back to a beginning already involves some recognition of what has come after. And there are as many beginnings as there are stories we tell about ourselves, our lives, our origins, and ultimately of the origin of all things, of the universe itself. Obviously, one thinks here of the opening words of the Bible in the beginning. What I simply want to show are some examples of the way in which beginnings of the universe are depicted in contemporary scientific format. So here is, here is this is a very famous picture, which many of you might have seen uh, from the far left of uh, it's a primordial fluctuations, the Big Bang. And here's another version uh, uh, of an inflationary view, what's called inflationary model from the beginning. I'm just some indication of the way in which uh, uh, cosmological origins are depicted. And here's one that you see twirling back on the bottom left to the Big Bang. But this one includes uh, primarily biological questions, uh, uh, evolution. We are fascinated by beginnings, and no one more so than St. Augustine who in his confessions offers a paradigmatic account of a search through time and memory to the very beginning of his life. The final books of the confessions contain a systematic reflection on both time and memory. And then Augustine seeks to remember, as it were, the ultimate beginning of all existence by a careful reading and explication of the opening of Genesis. Augustine's search for beginnings is a search to find God as the origin and continuing presence in his own life, and to find God as the creator of the entire universe. Augustine locates his own beginning and the story of his life's unfolding in the broader context of the origin of all things. When Aristotle writes about beginnings, he reminds us that a small mistake in the beginning often expands exponentially to produce error after error. This admonition has a special relevance in discussions with respect to cosmological, philosophical, and theological claims about the beginning of the universe, and especially the relationship between claims in cosmology and traditional understandings of the doctrine of creation. An initial error about different senses of what it means to begin is the beginning of all sorts of errors about the relationship between the doctrine of creation and the discoveries of contemporary science. Such errors often lead to a further error to think that advances in cosmology have eliminated the need for a creator. This conclusion that there is no creator has its beginning in a fundamental error about the various beginnings that the natural sciences, philosophy, and theology address. Well, what can cosmologists tell us about the creation of the universe? An answer to this question requires us to be clear about the explanatory domains of the natural sciences, philosophy, and theology. In such an enterprise, there is no better guide than Thomas Aquinas. And perhaps it seems strange to argue that what Thomas has to say about creation and science can speak directly to debates in our own day about the philosophical and theological implications of current cosmological speculations. Despite dangers of falling into anachronistic commentary or of failing to recognize profound differences in the ways in which terms such as science, creation, and time have come to be used in the centuries that separate us from Thomas Aquinas, 
Still, when it comes to drawing philosophical and theological conclusions from contemporary cosmology, insights from the Middle Ages remain very valuable. Astronomers often note that to look out at the heavens is to look back in time. Perhaps to look back in time to medieval discussions of creation and science will help us to look out more clearly and to avoid confusions about both what we are seeing and what the implications of contemporary science are. Recent developments in cosmology have been used to reach philosophical and theological conclusions about the beginning of the universe. In their book, The Grand Design, Stephen Hawking and Lennon Mladenow make the point that just as the universe has no edge, so there is no boundary, no beginning to time. Therefore, to ask what happened before the beginning or even at the beginning would be meaningless. And this is the first quotation from uh, Hawking and Vladimir. In the early universe, when the universe was small enough to be governed by both a general relativity and quantum theory, there were effectively four dimensions of space and none of time. That means that when we speak of the beginning of the universe, we are skirting the subtle issue that as we look backward toward the very early universe, time as we know it does not exist. We must accept that our usual ideas of space and time do not apply to the very early universe. This is, that is beyond our experience, but not beyond our imagination. Now, commenting on this claim when interviewed on television several years ago, Stephen Hawking said that nothing caused the Big Bang because there was no time at such a putative beginning. For Hawking, the relationship between cause and effect is essentially a temporal one. A cause always precedes temporally its effect. But his cosmology allows no time in which a creator would exist prior to what he creates. No time, hence no causal nexus, therefore no creator. Now, there are fundamental confusions in this analysis in which God's causality, for example, is considered as the same kind of causality that creatures exercise. And further confusion that the relationship between cause and effect is necessarily a temporal relationship. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit further later on in uh, this evening about confusions about notions of causality, but we see that already in this comment by uh, uh, Hawking and Mladenow. No time, because no time, no causal connection because cause and effect always involves temporal sequence. Citing a version of contemporary string theory, Hawking and Mladenow tell us that the creation of a great many universes out of nothing, quote, does not require the intervention of some supernatural being or God. Rather, these mutual, these multiple universes, quote, arise naturally from physical law. The principal argument Hawking and Mladenow offer is that once we recognize that our universe is but one of an almost infinite number of universes, then we do not need a special explanation. We do not need a grand designer for the very precise initial conditions that account for life and existence. Recent theories concerning what happened before the Big Bang, as well as those that speak of an endless series of Big Bangs or some version of a multiverse hypothesis, they're often attractive because these theories too deny a fundamental beginning to the universe and thus they appear to make the creator irrelevant. There is a desire in some cosmological circles to get rid of the troubling singularity of the Big Bang itself. 
a singularity that seems to indicate a beginning to the universe. Such theories about what happened before the Big Bang allow cosmologists like Neil Turok and Paul Steinhardt to claim that the Big Bang is not the beginning of space and time, but rather an event, the Big Bang, that is in principle fully describable using physical laws. Nor does the Big Bang happen only once, Turok says. Instead, the universe undergoes cycles of evolution. Roger Penrose, the Oxford mathematician, who, this is number two on the screen, uh, who won the 2020 Nobel Prize, is a proponent of what he calls conformal cyclic cosmology. According to, and there's a picture of it in case you're wondering what it looks like. Huh? Accor conformal cyclical cosmology, according to which the universe consists of perhaps infinite succession of eons, where each eon originates with its own Big Bang and has an unending, exponentially expanding future, consistent with a positive, <coughs> excuse me, cosmological constant. The remote future of each eon matches conformally the Big Bang of the next one. So you have a kind of upward series of eons, huh? in, in, according to Roger Penrose. It's just one of many such theories. And some cosmologists have used insights from quantum mechanics to offer accounts of the Big Bang itself. They speak of the Big Bang in terms of quantum tunneling from nothing, analogous to the way in which very small particles seem to emerge spontaneously from vacuums in laboratory experiments. Thus, they think that to explain the Big Bang in this way, as the fluctuation of a primal vacuum eliminates the need to have a creator and leads to the conclusion that physics itself is competent to explain the very beginning of the universe as a quantum fluctuation of a vacuum. One cosmologist, Alexander Valenk, argues that although the universe has a beginning, Modern physics can describe the emergence of the universe as a physical process that does not require a cause. This is quotation number three from Malenkin. What causes the universe to pop out of nothing? No cause is needed. If you have a radioactive atom, it will decay. And quantum mechanics gives the decay probability in a given interval of time, say a minute. There's no reason why the atom decayed at this particular moment and not another. The process is completely random. No cause is needed for the quantum creation of the universe. This is the notion of quantum tunneling for nothing. No cause is needed. Now, there are other thinkers who have embraced traditional Big Bang cosmology, which seems to affirm an absolute beginning to the universe as providing scientific justification for, if not actual confirmation of the Genesis account of creation. Now we're switching the analysis here to see how people affirming Big Bang cosmology or using Big Bang of cosmology to support creation, whereas people like Valenkin and the others have used cosmology to deny creation. Even Pope Pius XII once remarked that this cosmology, Big Bang cosmology, offered support for what the opening of Genesis revealed. The argument is that an initial singularity, the Big Bang as a singularity, outside the categories of space and time, points to a supernatural cause of the beginning of the universe. William Wayne Craig, and this is going to be number four on the screen, one of the better known proponents of this position, using Big Bang cosmology to support creation, outlines his argument in a simple syllogism. One, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. That's the use of Big Bang cosmology, number two. Three, therefore, the universe has a cause. It is created. Now, this argument of William Wayne Craig seems to have an immediate appeal. But, and further, in addition to referring to contemporary Big Bang cosmology to support the conclusion that the universe is temporally finite, 
and therefore created. Craig also invokes philosophical arguments about the impossibility of past times being infinite, an impossibility that leads ineluctably to the conclusion that the universe has a beginning. There's a long history of this philosophical argument, which says that if the universe didn't have a beginning, if the universe were eternal, there would be an infinite number of past days or an infinite number of past years. And an infinite number of past years is impossible. This is arguments about the impossibility of an actual infinity. If an actual infinity is impossible, the past cannot be eternal. If the past cannot be eternal, therefore it must have a beginning. Huh? So William Wayne Craig uses two arguments to support the view that the universe has a beginning. The argument from Big Bang cosmology and a more elaborate philosophical argument about the impossibility of an infinite past. This was a, this particular set of arguments about the impossibility of uh, uh, an infinite past uh, was hotly debated in the Middle Ages. And in fact, William Wayne Craig's first book is on what's called the Kalam cosmological argument. Kalam were Muslim theologians who use this very argument about the impossibility of an actual infinity of the past to argue for the fact that the world is created. And that argument, that, that medieval argument of Muslim theologians uh, continues to the present day. Now, the relationship between the temporal finitude of the universe argued for either on the basis of Big Bang cosmology or on the basis of this more uh, elaborate philosophical argument. The relationship between the temporal finitude of the universe and the conclusion that it is created can be found in the work of the Jesuit theologian and cosmologist, Robert J. Spitzer. In his book, New Proofs for the Existence of God, Contributions of Contemporary Physics and Philosophy, now that's number bottom part of number four here. Spitzer claims that modern physics shows us that the past time of the universe is finite. And since the universe has a finite past, it must have begun to be. And if the universe began to be, there must be a cause for this beginning. It must have been created. What is quite interesting here is that Spitzer accepts the arguments of Melanchthon in number three. Vilenkin argues in physics about the finitude of the past, huh? but Vilenkin doesn't come to the conclusion that therefore the universe is created. He doesn't think there needs to be a cause for the beginning, but Vilenkin does think that physics shows us that there is a beginning. Huh? Craig, but uh, Spitzer rejects Vilenkin's denial that there must be a cause for this beginning. Huh? So as we can see, I hope there is a debate as to whether or not contemporary cosmology discloses a beginning to the universe. And there's a debate as well, more explicitly philosophical, about whether a beginning to the universe requires a cause. Does cosmology show us there's a beginning or not? A debate. Does having a beginning require a cause? Another debate. Physicist Sean Carroll, in his book, The Big Picture, on the origins of life, meaning, and the universe itself, says, and this is number five, that causation is a, de a derived notion, is a derived notion rather than, uh, excuse me, causation, a derived notion rather than a fundamental one, is best thought of as acting within individual theories that rely on the concept. Talking about causes is not the right vocabulary to use when thinking about how the universe works at a deep level. Carroll argues that the first premise in Craig's syllogism, that whatever begins to exist as a cause, that's premise number one for Craig, whatever exists as a cause. Carroll says that claim is false. Indeed, Carroll rejects the legitimacy of asking for a cause of the universe as such. This is number six. 
Why should we expect that there are causes or explanations or a reason why in the universe in which we live? It is because the physical world inside of which we are embedded has two important features. There are unbreakable patterns, laws of physics. Things do not just happen, they obey laws. And there is an arrow of time stretching from the past to the future. The entropy was lower in the past, it increases toward the future. Therefore, when you find some event or state of affairs B today, we can very often trace it back in time to one or a couple of possible predecessor events that we therefore call the cause of that, which leads to B according to the laws of physics. But crucially, both of these features of the universe that allow us to speak the language of causes and effects are completely absent when we talk about the universe as a whole. We do not think that our universe is part of a bigger ensemble that obeys laws. Even if it is part of the multiverse, the multiverse is not part of a bigger ensemble that obeys laws. Therefore, Nothing gives us the right to demand some kind of external cause of the universe. Causality refers to events within the universe, not of the universe. Carol, I think, confuses one kind of causality, that between temporally separated events, with a much richer and broader notion of cause. Carroll thinks that causality follows from the laws of nature, huh? when in fact, it is really just the opposite. Indeed, the laws of nature reflect the causal relations that exist in the world. And thus, these laws of nature depend upon the priority of causal relations. Huh? Carroll reverses, he thinks, causes depend upon the laws of nature. And in rejecting the application of his restricted notion of cause to the question of the cause of the universe, he mistakenly thinks that he shows the falsity of traditional arguments for a cause of existence as such, that is, for an uncaused cause. Now, there are a lot of issues here about the nature of causality that we have to leave aside. Although I'm, it's a very important topic understanding properly what cause means. For now, however, I wanna to return to the question of creation and the beginning of the universe. You see, in a way, the current debate is about whether or not, as I've said, cosmology discloses a beginning of the universe. Hawking, for example, denies the intelligibility of such a notion, and others argue for variations of an eternal universe, a series of big bangs. William Lane Craig and Robert Spitzer claim that cosmology does indeed point to a beginning. The debate framed in such terms about a beginning lead the exponents either to reject or to embrace the idea of creation. Despite fundamental differences as to what contemporary cosmology tells us, all these views tend to identify what it means for the universe to be created with the universe's having a temporal beginning. This emphasis on beginnings leads to confusion about creation. The error here is to think that creation necessarily means that the universe has a temporal beginning. If creation and beginning are connected in this way, it becomes easy to see how a denial of there being a beginning leads to a denial of creation and how an affirmation of a scientific account of beginning leads to an affirmation of creation. I think this is a fundamental confusion. Now, another reason for thinking that creation must involve a beginning concerns confusions about nothing in the expression creation out of nothing. 
the tendency is to think that coming to be out of nothing, which is feature of the doctrine of creation, that coming to be out of nothing must refer to a beginning, and that accordingly, different accounts of nothing can now eliminate the need for a creator. Just as there are confusions about beginning, so too there are confusions about nothing. Next slide, please. Alexander Valenk, number eight, who accepts a version of quantum tunneling from nothing as a description of the origin of the universe, notes that nothing in his account is a state with no classical space time the realm of unrestrained gravity. It's a rather bizarre state in which all our basic notions of space, time, energy, entropy, etc., lose their meaning. Polenkin offers the following thought experiment. Imagine space-time as the surface of a sphere, and then suppose that the sphere is thinking, excuse me, shrinking, like a balloon losing its air. As the radius grows smaller, it eventually goes to zero. The surface of the sphere disappears and with it space-time itself. We have arrived at nothingness. We have also arrived at a precise definition of nothingness, a closed space-time of zero radius. This is the most complete and utter nothingness that scientific concepts can capture. It is mathematically devoid, not only of stuff, but also of location and duration. I'm reminded of a comment once made by Woody Allen, who said, cosmic nothingness is okay, so long as you are properly dressed for it. And talking about the uh, uh, eternity and the eternal past, he also made a comment I'm uh, thinking about, uh, Woody Allen said, eternity is very long, especially near the end. So I pass those sort of witticisms from Woody Allen. Now, this is Volenkin on nothing. The nothing in some cosmological models that speak of the Big Bang in terms of quantum tunneling from nothing. That nothing in number eight is not the nothing referred to in the traditional sense of creation out of nothing. The nothing in all these cosmological reflections may very well be nothing like our present universe, but it is not the absolute nothing central to what it means to create. It is only that about which the theories say nothing. One of my friends uh, often introduces me to giving lectures on su the subject. He says, I, what do I do? I go about the world making distinctions about nothing. But it's crucial to make these distinctions. Another example about of confusion about different senses of nothing. And again, my point here is that this confusion about what talking about the universe having a beginning is connected here to confusions about creation out of nothing. Uh, this is, can be seen in Lawrence Krauss's book, A Universe from Nothing, Why There is Something Rather Than Nothing. And this is quotation number nine. The question of why there is something rather than nothing is really a scientific question, not a religious or philosophical question, because both nothing and something are scientific concepts. And our discoveries over the past 30 years have completely changed what we mean by nothing. Hence, no appeal to a creator is needed. Science is sufficient to explain something's coming from nothing. Offering a striking landscape of ever deeper senses of nothing, beyond even that of vacuums and empty space, Krauss concludes, this is number 10, we have discovered that all signs suggest a universe that could and plausibly did arise from a deeper nothing, involving the absence of space itself, and which one day may return to nothing via processes that may not only be comprehensible, but also processes that do not require any external 
control, or direction. Now, Krauss is aware of philosophical and theological objections to any attempt to relate his sense or senses of nothing with the nothing central to the traditional doctrine of creation of nothing. Nevertheless, he writes, and this is number 11, some philosophers and many theologians define and redefine nothing as not being any of the versions of nothing that scientists currently debate. But therein, in my opinion, lies the intellectual bankruptcy of much of theology and some of modern philosophy. For surely, this, this is the most extraordinary adverb in all of the texts, surely nothing is every bit as physical as something, especially if it is defined as the absence of something. It then behooves us to understand precisely the physical nature of both these quantities, nothing and something. And without science, any definition is just words. This is a magnificent quotation. Well, despite a widespread interest in nothing or various levels of nothingness, the nothing to which many authors, especially Lawrence Krauss, refer is really something even at times a quasi-ambiguous reality. But the nothing in the traditional understanding of creation out of nothing only refers to the absence of everything other than God. Now, of course, in a way, to speak of other than God risks the danger of locating God and things on the same metaphysical plane, perhaps different only in degree. Nor ought we to think that this creation out of nothing uh, means that there are two realities, two ultimate principles, God and nothing. Creation out of nothing does not mean that God changes nothing into something. Rather, creation out of nothing is a way of affirming that it is God and God alone and nothing else which is the cause, was the cause of absolutely everything that is. Now, another cosmologist, Lee Smolin, in Three Roads to Quantum Gravity, calls into question the meaningfulness of asking questions about an ultimate origin of the universe. His claim is, this is number 12, the universe cannot have been made by anything that exists outside of it. For by definition, the universe is all there is, and there can be nothing outside of it. Accordingly, the first principle of cosmology must be there is nothing outside the universe. The first principle means that we take the universe to be, by definition, a closed system. It means that the explanation for anything in the universe can involve only other things that also exist in the universe. It's the kind of first principle of cosmology. We need to recognize, however, that there are different senses of first principles. Some are first with respect to a restricted area of investigation. For example, the first principles of the natural sciences. Other first principles would be first in a kind of absolute sense, referring to all categories of explanation. So there are different... And Smolin's first principles are, are restricted really to cosmology. Confusions concerning creation and cosmology run the gamut. From denials of creation because the universe is conceived as having no beginning, to explanations of a beginning in exclusively scientific terms which avoid any appeal to a creator, to opposing claims that the Big Bang itself offers a kind of scientific warrant for belief in God's creation of the universe. All of these theories, pro and con creation, embrace what I've called the error of beginnings. Well, but if creation ought not to be identified necessarily with the beginning of the universe, what does it mean? Now, these passages in red are my words from the lecture. I put them on the screen because I think they offer a good emphasis of the points I'm going to make. 
the metaphysics of creation. Creation is not a change. Number 13, contrary to all these claims that use cosmology either to deny or to affirm creation, we need to recognize that creation is a metaphysical and theological affirmation that all that is, in whatever way or ways it is, depends upon God as cause. The natural sciences, including cosmology, have as their subject the world of changing things from subatomic particles to acorns to galaxies. Whenever there is a change, there must be something that changes. Whether these changes are biological or cosmological, without beginning or end or temporally finite, they remain processes. Creation, on the other hand, is the radical causing of the whole existence of whatever exists. Creation is not a change. To cause completely something to exist is not to produce a change in something, is not to work on or with some existing material. At the very least, this is the traditional understanding of creation. Creatio non est mutatio, as Thomas says. Creation is not a change. 14. Cosmology and all the other natural sciences offer accounts of change. They do not address the metaphysical and theological questions of creation. They do not speak to why there is something rather than nothing. It is a mistake to use arguments in the natural sciences to deny creation. It is also a mistake to appeal to cosmology as a confirmation of creation. Now, discussions about creation are different from arguments from order and design to a source of order and design. Similarly, discussions about the fine tuning of the initial conditions of the universe do not directly concern the topic of creation. Thus, whether or not multiverse theories do away with the need to explain such fine tuning, as for example, Hawking claims, they do not provide these theories, multiverse theories, do not provide a commentary on creation. Creation, as I've suggested, offers an explanation of why things exist at all. So it may very well be that natural philosophy, working with the discoveries of the empirical sciences, can lead us to knowledge of the existence of God as unmoved mover, for example. But this would not yet be knowledge of God as creator. For this type of knowledge, we need metaphysics and ultimately revelation. So I don't want to deny that the natural sciences cannot lead us to a knowledge of God. But, not, but I do deny that the natural sciences uh, can lead us to a knowledge of God as creator. To understand God as creator can be understood philosophically, but in metaphysics, not in the natural sciences, not in natural philosophy. What it means for God to create is radically different from any kind of human making. When human beings make things, they work with already existing material to produce something new. The human act of creating in, is not the complete cause of what is produced, but God's creative act is the complete cause of what is produced. This sense of being the complete cause is captured in the expression out of nothing. To be such a complete cause of all that is, requires an infinite power, and no creature, no human being possesses such infinite power. God wills things to be, and thus they are. To say that God is the complete cause of all that is does not negate the role of other causes, which are part of the created natural order. Creatures, both animate and inanimate, are real causes of the wide array of changes that occur in the world. 
but God alone is the universal cause of being as such as existence. God's causality is so different from the causality of creatures that there is no competition between the two. That is, we do not need to limit, as it were, God's causality to make room for the causality of creatures. God causes creatures to be causes. This kind of analysis of God's causality and creaturely causality is central for understanding evolution and the relationship between evolutionary biology and conceptions of God's causality. Now, my analysis thus far has been heavily influenced by the thought of Thomas Aquinas, but now I shall be a little more explicit in my reference to it. Already in the 13th century, the groundwork was set for the fundamental understanding of creation and its relationship to the natural sciences. Working within the context of Aristotelian science and aided by the insights of Muslim and Jewish thinkers, as well as his Christian predecessors, Thomas Aquinas provided an analysis of creation and science, which remains true. And this was the subject of the course I taught this summer at the University of Wuhan about metaphysics and creation in the, in the Middle Ages. And I told the students in Wuhan, I said, one of the we want to understand these arguments. Uh, they're interesting, but most importantly, they remain true. And of course, that was quite an interesting discussion. We had how do we know they remain true? Well, anyway, the next, next slide, please. One of the key texts from Thomas on this subject is from his treatise on separated substances, one of his later treatises. And he writes, this is number 15, over and above the mode of becoming by which something comes to be through change or motion, there must be a mode of becoming or origin of things without any mutation or motion through the influx of being. A couple of things here. Notice in the English translation, he says, there must be a mode of becoming. That phrase captures a fundamental point that Thomas will make. Thomas thinks that creation, understood as the cause of existence, is philosophically demonstrable in the discipline of metaphysics. In his first writings on uh, creation, in his commentary on the sentences of Peter Lombard, he says the following in introducing uh, one of his respondents. Not only does faith hold that there is creation, but reason also demonstrates it. Okay? Thomas thinks that reason demonstrates that the world is created. Furthermore, he attributes the demonstration to Aristotle. But at the very least, Thomas thinks that we, now that the, what is demonstrated is that there is an origin of things without any mutation or motion to the influx of being. That can be demonstrated philosophically. That sentence, not only does faith hold that there's creation, but reason also demonstrates it, is one of the more radical sentences of the 13th century. It's a sentence with which his teacher, Albert the Great, would disagree. His colleague at Bonavent at, at Paris, University of Paris, Bonavent, would disagree. But it's an important feature of Thomas Aquinas' analysis. To Thomas, creation means a dependence in being, which is a notion in metaphysics, not in the natural sciences. To be caused to be by God means to be dependent upon God for the fact that one is. The relationship here between divine cause and created effect is one of metaphysical dependence. Indeed, the fundamental sense of causality involves dependence and not any temporal relationship of prior and posterior. Now notice that Thomas distinguishes between the mode of becoming by which something comes to be through change or motion from the more fundamental sense of creation that he identifies as the influx of being. The latter, the influx of being, is the causing of existence as such. 
that little phrase, as such, is very important. It helps us to recognize the difference between causing something to come to be or to exist in the ways in which, for example, animals produce offspring, animals cause offspring to exist, between that kind of causing and the causing of the actuality of whatever is as it is, which is God's causing. Creation is not primarily some distant event. In fact, it's really not an event at all, but it's not some distant. Rather, it is the ongoing, complete causing of the existence of all that is. At this very moment, were God not causing all that is to exist, there would be nothing at all. Creation concerns, first of all, the origin of the universe, not its temporal beginning. Indeed, it's important to recognize this distinction between origin and beginning. The former affirms the complete, continuing dependence of all that is on God as cause. Whatever is created has its origin in God. But we ought not to think that to be created must mean that whatever is created has a temporal beginning. It may very well be that the universe had a temporal beginning as the traditional interpretation of the opening of Genesis acknowledges. But there is no contradiction in the notion of an eternal created universe. For were the universe to be without a beginning, it still would have an origin. It still would be created. This was precisely the position of Thomas Aquinas, who accepted as a matter of faith that the universe had a temporal beginning but also defended the intelligibility of a universe created and eternal. As I said, unlike his teacher, Albert the Great, or his colleague at the University of Paris, Bonaventure, Thomas did not think that out of nothing had to mean after nothing, such that a created universe was impossible. Both Albert and Bonaventure thought creation out of nothing had to mean after nothing. As we've already seen in Stephen Hawking's denial of God's causing the universe to be, because there is no time, hence no temporal priority, hence no causality to be exercised, cause and effect are often seen as necessarily involving a temporal sequence. But Thomas can speak of an eternal universe as being caused by God because he does not limit the relationship between cause and effect to a temporal sequence. And of course, he distinguishes between God's causality and that which creatures exercise. God's causality as creator is prior to the created effect, but the priority is not a temporal priority. It is, I think, the failure to recognize that to be created does not necessarily entail a temporal beginning. That causes considerable confusion in contemporary debates about the implications of cosmology for arguments about whether or not the universe is created. This error about beginnings continues to be the beginning of all sorts of errors about what cosmology can properly describe and what creation is. Now, Thomas Aquinas thought that neither science nor philosophy could know whether the universe had a beginning. He did think that metaphysics could show us that the universe is created, but he would have warned against those today who use Big Bang cosmology, for example, to conclude that the universe has a beginning and therefore must be created. He was always alert, next slide, please, he was always alert to reject the use of bad arguments in support of what is believed. Number 17 from the Summa. That the world had a beginning is an object of faith, but not a demonstration of science. And we do well to keep this in mind. Otherwise, if we presumptuously undertake to demonstrate what is faith, we may introduce arguments that are not strictly conclusive. And this would furnish infidels with an occasion for scoffing, as they would think that we assent to truths of faith on such grounds. 
So the singularity in traditional Big Bang cosmology may indeed represent the beginning of the universe we observe, but we cannot conclude that it is the absolute beginning, the kind of beginning that would indicate creation. As some contemporary cosmologists recognize, there could very well be something before the beginning, the Big Bang. When it came to how to read the opening of Genesis, Thomas observed that what is essential in the opening of Genesis is the fact of creation, not the manner or mode of the formation of the world. Questions concerning order, design, and chance in nature refer to the manner or mode of formation of the world. Attempts in the natural sciences to explain these things, order, design, and so forth, do not challenge the fact of creation. A world with a temporal beginning concerns the kind of world God has created. It may very well be easier to accept that a world which had an absolute temporal beginning is a created world. And such a world with an absolute beginning may be especially appropriate for understanding sacred history, important as that is for believers. But an eternal world, one without a beginning in time, would be no less a created world. Cosmological theories are easily used, or rather misused, to support or to deny creation. Each time, however, as I have suggested, to create has been joined inextricably to temporal finitude, such that to be created necessarily means to begin to be. Thus, to deny a beginning is to deny creation. It was the genius of Thomas Aquinas to distinguish between creation understood philosophically, with no reference to temporality, and creation understood theologically, which included the recognition that the universe does have an absolute temporal beginning. The philosophical sense means that God, with no material cause, makes all things to exist as beings that are radically different from himself and yet completely dependent upon his causality. This philosophical sense of creation has two essential elements. One, there's no material cause in creation, no stuff whatsoever out of which God makes the world. And two, the creature is completely dependent throughout its entire duration upon the constant causality of the creator. The philosoph this philosophical sense of creation is the sense in which creation out of nothing is a subject in metaphysics concerning the complete dependence of all that is on a cause of existence. Now, finally, there is a wider confusion at work here as well, wider than the confusion, confusing of creation with beginnings. It is the failure to distinguish between creation and the changes that occur within the created order, and hence the failure to recognize that the natural sciences, including cosmology, have nothing to tell us about the ultimate cause of the existence of things. God's creative power is exercised throughout the entire course of cosmic history in whatever ways that history has unfolded. No explanation of cosmological or biological change, no matter how radically random or contingent such an explanation claims to be, no such explanation challenges the metaphysical account of creation that is, of the dependence of the existence of all things upon God as cause. When some thinkers deny creation on the basis of theories in the natural sciences, or use cosmology to confirm creation, or reject the conclusions of science in defense of creation, they misunderstand creation or the natural sciences or both. Experiments being performed at the Large Hadron Collider, that huge underground, underground particle accelerator on the Swiss-French border. Those experiments may bring us closer to what happened just after the Big Bang. 
but they will tell us nothing about creation. The distance between minute fractions of a second after the Big Bang and creation is in a sense infinite. We do not get closer to creation by getting closer to the Big Bang. Furthermore, as we've seen, some contemporary cosmologists argue that there could very well be something before the Big Bang. Similarly, excitement about the recent discovery of gravitational waves, referred to as ripples in the fabric of space-time, has encouraged some, like cosmologist Neil Turok, to speculate that we may soon be able, quote, to see what happened at the moment the universe began. But for whatever beginning these gravitational waves might provide evidence, it's not the kind of absolute beginning central to the theological doctrine of creation, a beginning or origin that we have seen is, first of all, separate from any notion of time. We need to avoid the error of thinking that discussions in the natural sciences about beginnings have anything whatsoever to tell us about the creation of the universe. Thank you very much. Also, if you're interested in uh, how I talk about the subject, I wrote an essay no more than a year ago, about Darwin, Marx, Aquinas, and China. And that's available on at that on public discourse. And I, I've written many uh, uh, essays. There are about 2,000, 2,500 words, probably about 25 or 30 such essays uh, on these and related topics of public discourse.